face-to-face -face meeting and President Trump accepting the invitation, sending shockwaves around the world. This is Outnumbered. I'm Sandra Smith, and here today, Harris Faulkner, Town Hall editor and Fox News contributor Katie Pavlich, former deputy spokesperson for the State Department and Fox News analyst Marie Harf, and joining us on the couch today, Congressman Sean Duffy, Republican from the great state of Wisconsin, and he is outnumbered. Congressman, hey. always good to have you. Welcome it is back. Great to be with you, ladies. The smartest and best looking couch on daytime television. Oh, thank hey. you. Well, Hello. Thank you. Yeah. Absolutely. All right, my work is done here. Good. Good. Great trip. Show Thank on. You. Have her have a good weekend. Later. All right, let's get started. We could be looking at history in the making as North Korean dictator Kim Jong Un requests a sit down with President Trump as soon as possible. The when and where have yet to be decided, but the potential milestone is already drawing praise from Democrats and Republicans alike. Former White House Press Secretary Sean Spicer reacting earlier today. Kim Jong-un is coming to the table. He's going to have a discussion with the president about denuclearizing the continent. That's a huge win for the South Korean people. It's a huge win for our allies in, in Asia, and it's a huge win for this country. So let's let the details unfold, but we've got to stop trying to figure out what's going to happen next and just let the, the, the process unfold. So far, the president's shown that he's been very successful both domestically and internationally in moving this country forward. But some do remain skeptical of progress with the rogue regime, given its track record. Here's Senator Marco Rubio, member of the Foreign Relations Committee. Donald Trump was elected because of his willingness to do things that other politicians and presidents haven't done, and this is right along the lines of that, so I won't be critical of it. But I ultimately think that Kim Jong-un deeply believes that the only way he survives and doesn't become Gaddafi or doesn't become Saddam Hussein is if he has nuclear weapons, and if he gives them up, there's no reason why they won't come in after him. Chief White House Correspondent John Roberts is live at the White House with the latest on this. John. Sandra, remember where we were 18 hours ago and how surprised we were that the news had come out that the president had accepted the invitation for talks. The White House was asked last night in a background briefing call, uh, why not begin with low-level talks? Why start right at the top? And the White House saying that, uh, you know, other, regime, other regimes, other administrations have tried low-level talks before, trying to move their way up. Nothing really happened, so let's shake it up and try it a little bit differently. That is what the president is known for, as you pointed out. The president speaking with Xi Jinping, the president of China, this morning about what transpired yesterday. Also thanking China for helping to put maximum pressure on North Korea and bring them to the table. The big question now, is Kim Jong-un really sincere about giving up his nuclear program, or is this all just a ruse to play for time? The president, at least on the surface, being cautiously optimistic in a tweet this morning saying, Kim Jong-un talked about denuclearization with the South Korean representatives, not just a freeze. Also, no missile testing by North Korea during this period of time. Great progress being made, but sanctions will remain until an agreement is reached, meeting being planned. South Korea's national security advisor, Chung Wee Yong, credited the president's program of maximum pressure on North Korea for getting to this point. NSC spokesman Michael Anton says the president's get tough approach to North Korea is finally bearing fruit. Listen here. We believe the sanctions are working. We know for a fact that this amount of pressure has never been brought on the regime before, that they've un under pressure like they've never been. And China has put more pressure on the North than we've ever seen before. Not as much as we would like. The president said he was going to keep up sanctions on North Korea. And according to South Korea, Kim Jong-un also understands that the joint U.S.-South Korean military exercises must continue. That had been a real sticking point for Kim Jong-un before. The president going into this with his eyes wide open. He has pointed out consistently that North Korea uses these opportunities to engage in dialogue with the United States to get something and then lie and cheat their way out of it. Lindsey Graham with a very sharp warning to Kim Jong-un last night saying in a statement, and quote, a word of warning to North Korean President Kim Jong-un, worst possible thing you can do is meet with President Trump in person and try to play him. If you do that, it will be the end of you and your regime. Uh, a lot of speculation as to the location and where all of this is going to happen. Uh, likely it wouldn't happen in North Korea. I'm told that Panmunjom, which is where Kim Jong-un will be meeting with South Korean President Moon Jae-in uh, sometime in May, which is right along the border there between North and South Korea. You see the, the blue huts and the big building in the background. It's also where that North Korean soldier uh, was shot as he was trying to defect across the line. I'm told that that's not really in the offing. Uh, you don't want the president to be traveling halfway around the world to give 
Kim the PR victory of a meeting with the president. You kind of want him, I'm told, uh, to come hat in hand to the president to say, okay, let's talk about this. Uh, where they eventually meet, Sandra, that is going to be a really, really interesting question. It's going to be fascinating to watch, and there's going to be quite a bit of time to speculate on all of that as we await a date, time, where. John Roberts, thank you. Thank you. At the White House for us. Congressman, your thoughts? Well, listen, I think it's important to note that the North Koreans have made promises in the past, and they continue to break those promises. So that we're a little bit leery of what North Korea is going to do here, I think is appropriate. We shouldn't be doing car wheels in the street quite mm -hmm. yet. But uh, we have a president who is doing things differently. Um, listen, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. The last three presidents, Republicans and Democrats, have done the same thing. They've gotten the same results. Donald Trump has taken a different pack, a uh, different track. I mean, you know, I've got a bigger button than you. My nuclear weapons work. Little Rocket Man. <laughs> Everybody criticized him for that. But I think we have a real open door here to see if we can resolve this peacefully with North Korea, as opposed to we're got. Well, I think we're on a track to saying that we can't allow them to have nukes. Yes. If that's the case, you're going to have a, 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 a military conflict. And that is a horrible result. So kudos to Donald Trump for pushing the conversation and maybe getting a different result in war or allowing North Korea. Marie, what are your thoughts on this? I mean, it's amazing to see how this all unfolded yeah. last night with the president walking in the briefing room saying this announcement was coming. South Korea made it at the White House. Mm -hmm. uh, and now we know that the president is intending to meet with him. This is high stakes diplomacy. And I agree with the congressman on almost everything he said that uh, talking is certainly better than war and trying to resolve this peacefully is in everyone's best interest if we can do so we shouldn't be naive and one meeting I don't think we should think that this one meeting will solve the whole thing what the Trump administration needs to do now before they meet is put together a diplomatic strategy what are the tactical specifics you want out of these negotiations what does an agreement look like we know the broad strokes what are the details? And that will be a lot of the legwork that's done in the coming weeks and months before they meet. It is, this, is going, this is the biggest stage. This is going to be the biggest and most important meeting President Trump has had overseas. Well, and remember the history Period. that the United States had with Madeleine Albright and the embarrassment that we suffered during the Clinton years when, you know, she went and tried for six hours, I think it was, to convince the Kim Dynasty's ill, Un's dad, uh, to do some of what we're talking about doing today. It didn't go well. It was uh, not received well around the world. Like, did you make it worse for some questions that came up? This is such a different type of opportunity. And what you point out with the tweets was almost a one-on-one -on -one conversation that this president was having for the world to see on Twitter with this rogue leader, as we like to call him. Yeah. You know he got those messages. And when the USS Carl Vinson pulled in off the coast of Vietnam, Da Nang, just a few days ago, China got a message. The world is getting a message from this president. Now the question is, what will Kim Jong-un's message be? Well, the interesting too, thing, too, is China's role in this. Mm -hmm. So the administration has been trying to pressure China, who's been cheating and still allowing North Korea to get around their sanctions by delivering things via ship secretly, and they deny that these things yep. have happened. Mm -hmm. But if you look at those kinds of negotiations and what the administration has asked for, China wanted the United States to talk directly to the North Koreans. Yeah. They have been saying for a very long time, look, you know, you're pressuring us to get in the middle of this, and you're, you're acting like we have all of this political capital uh, uh, over Kim Jong-un, and we actually really don't. And if you want to solve this problem, you're going to have to have direct talks between the, the North Koreans and U.S. officials. Now, I'm not sure they were talking about directly uh, the president of the <laughs> right. United States speaking directly with right. the dictator of North Korea, but here we are. And when you go back to last night and the North South Korean officials, who, who they briefed in the room before the announcement was made, uh, mm -hmm. General uh, uh, Mattis, Secretary of Defense, was there. General McMaster uh, was briefed on this. Mm -hmm. My question, though, is where does Secretary Rex Tillerson play in all of this? Because yesterday yeah. the spokesperson well, for so state was saying the opposite the that was happening. And he apparently I mean, didn't have a South know Korean this ambassador right now. No one's been nominated yet. And, and Rex Tillerson is on a, a lengthy trip to Africa right now. And there are reports coming out of there that he may not have known. Every, yesterday he was singing a very different tune about right. negotiations. So Katie's right. He has not, I think, been as important a part of this process as Mattis and McMaster, but he needs to be because of this. Kind of it, don't forget that uh, all the concessions were made on the North Koreans' part. They're not going to test nuclear weapons. Right. They're not going to test missiles. On our and we're, and, and we're going to still continue to do, do our military exercises with South Korea. Um, it's kind of a historic move for the North. Right. If you want to say that the Kim regime blinked, I think that's a fair And assessment. with the battleship, you told China that they need to do what they need to do, too. That's right. Yeah. Okay.
Meanwhile, Blackwater founder Eric Prince pushing back against the top dem on the House Intel Committee when it comes to his testimony about that meeting in the Seychelles after the his 18th district tomorrow to stump for Rick Saccone, who is battling Democrat Connor Lamb for a seat many see as a 2018 bellwether. The polling shows a tight race in a working class district deep in Pennsylvania steel country. Think about what happened with steel this week. Uh, they went heavily for President Trump. Counselor to the president, Kellyanne Conway, was in the district campaigning for Saccone yesterday. And the president underscores the high stakes and fundraising letter saying, quote, I need more Republicans in Congress, and this is the most crucial race in the country. Democrats are not invested in helping everyday Americans, and they are spending millions to defeat Rick and elect another puppet for Nancy Pelosi. Both political parties have been bombarding the airwaves with attack ads for weeks. A GOP spot paints Lamb as one of Nancy Pelosi's sheep. Although the political newcomer says he won't support Pelosi. Actually, what he said is he wouldn't vote for her. Watch. His name is Connor Lamb, but in Washington, he'd be one of Nancy Pelosi's sheep. Lamb would join the liberal flock and follow Pelosi's lead, voting the straight liberal party line for Pelosi's extreme agenda. Uh, Marie Harp says his name is unfortunate. And an ad from Lamb paints his Republican opponent as just another typical politician. Haven't we had enough of political hypocrisy this year? Now comes Rick Saccone. He talks tough on spending, but now we find out Saccone has spent over $400,000 on meals, per diems, and lease payments to a political donor, all from an expense account paid for by the taxpayers. Congressman, your thoughts on what's about to happen in pin 18, as they say on Twitter? Well, Harris, I would say that special elections are special. Um, they really okay. are. So this, this is about enthusiasm. This is about can you turn your voters out. I, I would tell you in my district, it's probably similar to this district mm -hmm. where this race is happening. Um, we're not losing Republican voters, but Republican voters are content. Mm -hmm. And when they're content, they don't show up at the polls. Now, if you look at the left, the resist movement, every Democrat is going to come out and vote. That enthusiasm gap is why we have a race that is so tight, but I don't think we should mistake the fact that Connor Lamb mm -hmm. will get in line under Nancy Pelosi's leadership. He will support Nancy Pelosi. He'll be part of the movement to impeach Donald Trump. These elections have consequences. Instead of being 24 away, uh, 24 votes or 24 members away from a Nancy Pelosi speakership, we would now be 23 votes away uh, or members away from a Nancy Pelosi speakership. These are uh, these are serious races. Boss move to bring up steel this week, no matter how it fell for the yeah. president or didn't the topic. Well, the steel tariffs moved at neck break speed. I mean, the president had that meeting with the CEOs and the business leaders at the, in, in, at the White the House. On Saturday? And, then, yeah, and then a week later, exactly. you know, here they are signed yesterday. They're all talking about it. But when it comes to the Democrat question here, Democrats certainly are uh, mobilized. They, they realize that when they didn't get out to vote for Hillary Clinton, that complacency is a bad thing for them. Mm -hmm. When you look at the makeup of this county or this district, although there are more Democrat registered voters, mm -hmm. I think a lot of them probably voted for President Trump in the last election. Absolutely. And, and for Tim Murphy, who was the Congress right, leader for a long right, time. Right, exactly. So when you have the president going, talking about the things that he is doing in Washington to stand up for him and saying that his candidate is going to do the same, that's helpful for him. For him. So Democrats are going to have to convince those Democrats on their side, wow. those registered voters, to back away from the Trump-endorsed candidate, because I think a lot of them probably like what the president is doing. So, Marie, why do you think Democrats voted potentially for, uh, or would, voted for, for President Trump in that area? Well, I think there are a lot of reasons, and the economic message is probably at the top of that list. I think there are a lot of Democrats that didn't like Hillary Clinton, candidly, um, which I think is unfortunate. But Katie's right. They realize complacency has a price. In this election, though, we haven't seen Donald, Donald Trump's support for these special election candidates result in a lot of wins. His popularity with his base has not translated to wins electorally. What is interesting is that this race is even so close. I mean, you know, President Trump did win by a lot, and it hasn't been that long. Rick Saccone is not a particularly good candidate. Connor Lamb is an interesting Democrat. I disagree with the congressman. He has said he will not vote for Nancy Pelosi to be speaker. And I think that this is a wave movement among younger Democrats if they win. Even if we take the House, Nancy Pelosi's out of speaker. I just started to think, gee, what is the unemployment rate in the state? I know you know what it is in the state of Wisconsin. <laughs> in the state of uh, Pennsylvania, 4.8 percent. So yeah. it is it is not significantly, but it is above the national average, 4.1% national average there at 4.8%. Economy is going to be a huge message. And the president's going to show up there and deliver this rally on the heels of 
a really yeah. strong jobs report that came out this morning on a Friday uh, for the month of February. Mm -hmm. 300,000 jobs added. He's going to have the ability, and he's going to want to, tout that economic message hard and yeah. tax reform. Well, part of that message, too, Congressman, has to do with the fact that it's not just one or two states. There are Americans all over the country that are, have opened up bigger paychecks. That's right, and I think that's why uh, the, the tax bill has been so successful, and so people in t Pennsylvania have bigger paychecks. They like that uh, Trump is defending uh, steel. It's going to be a close race, but I, I do think it comes down to energy. I would, mm -hmm. I would, I would, I, I don't think we're losing Republican voters. We just don't have that. By the way, what is the unemployment rate in Wisconsin? Three percent, three point one percent. Wow, well, well Scott Walker. Walker. Well I know we talked about uh, Scott Walker, the guy on Governor. your side, maybe not being the, uh, you know. Uh, the one, well, all right, we'll move on. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I don't have time for me to complete that thought. <laughs> a growing showdown now. President Trump says tariffs are needed for national security and to protect American workers. We were just talking about steel yeah. and mm -hmm. aluminum. But critics say they could lead to a trade war. We'll talk about it. And the president called the mayor of Oakland, California. Decades, in fact, by unfair foreign trade practices leading to the shuttered plants and mills the laying off of millions of workers and the decimation of entire communities. And that's going to stop. We want our workers to be protected and we want, frankly, our companies to be protected. Chief Congressional Correspondent Mike Emanuel is live in Washington with the latest on this. Hey, Mike. Sandra, good afternoon. The politics of this quite fascinating, putting some of President Trump's congressional Republican allies in an awkward spot. House Speaker Paul Ryan was doing an event in Atlanta yesterday at Home Depot. Ryan was asked to weigh in on the new tariffs, and he expressed the hope they can be adjusted to be more targeted and surgical. A key Senate ally who has said President Trump could be the greatest in our history is not happy about the new tariffs. Well, I think there's a chance that we will nullify them, at least if I have my way, because I just don't see it personally. Uh, I, I generally support the president on just about everything, but uh, I think he's been misled, and there, there are some people down there who have been misleading him on some of these things. A member of the Senate Republican leadership says he is worried about unintended consequences. I just have concerns uh, that this sort of thing may have repercussions at home that uh, that that I don't want to see. Certainly, the, okay. what we have to export in Wyoming is quite a bit, and we want to keep those markets open. We need more customers, not fewer. Some Democrats, those in the Rust Belt, and even the Senate Democratic leader, are praising President Trump for getting tough on Beijing. Well, President Trump has identified the right opponent, China much better than both the Obama and Bush administrations did. Both Democrats and Republicans have been blind to this issue, and Trump isn't. Good. I'm encouraged. I really am. And I think it gives us a chance, basically, to reboot, get jobs back to West Virginia, back to America. I'm, I'm excited about that. And you know, everyone's it's the saber rattling going on. It's going to cause this kind of a war and a trade war and on and on and on. And, and I just think that's really Wall Street. It's Wall Street speaking. It's not Main Street. Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin says he thinks more countries may be exempted from the tariffs over the next two weeks. Sandra? Mike Emanuel, thank you for that. So, where does all of this go? Is this going to end up to be a big win for the president, and will everyone, all his critics, be proven wrong? Well, he's, he's trying to thread a needle. I mean, is the, there's a real threat. We could have a trade war. But um, the question becomes, aren't we actually in a trade war? I mean, we've had a, an American open policy where foreign products can come in, for the most part, free of tariff. But when we try to sell our goods overseas, oftentimes there's tariff and taxes. Mm -hmm. And so on this one, you have, you have uh, the Chinese subsidizing or dumping their steel on the world, world market. But in Wisconsin, I brought this uh, point up earlier in the day, we sell Harleys. So you might have an increased cost of you know, more aluminum or metal that goes into the Harley. Mm -hmm. But when we take that Harley and sell it to China, they have a 30% tariff on yeah. our Harley. When we sell that same Harley in India, they have a 100% tariff on that product. When India sells their bikes into America, zero tariff. And so what I think Donald Trump is trying to say is, I want fair trade, I want open trade, but uh, you can't abuse the American worker and not think we're going to respond. And that's why I like his point that we're going to mirror or have reciprocity with regards to tariffs and taxes. So you sound understanding of it, but Paul Ryan, he, he has his fears, Mitch McConnell, they, they 
fear truly a, a trade well, war. They're hearing from constituents too and people with businesses who have their fears. You Pastry. know, aluminum <laughs> companies making beer cans and that sort of thing. But that, that's small, but I'll tell you this, the, the Europeans have been smart, so they want to come after American mm -hmm. products that they don't make, so jeans, cranberries. Mm -hmm. and <laughs> I have the largest producers of cranberries in my district, and, and really? think not that I have heard from my cranberry <laughs> growers, <laughs> but if he plays this out right, um, we actually could lower tariffs, have more trade, and more American workers having good paying jobs. Well, yeah. you had me at Harley Davidson. <laughs> they roar. I think it depends <laughs> do, on what the result is here. Right. So the administration is taking a huge risk. We know what the history is with tariffs in the United Actually get into the White House. How do I make connections? Because we don't know anybody from the campaign, number one. Mm. Number two, to have a back channel is not illegal. All right. what, what's the big deal about a back channel?